local global BRM community. Um, I'm going to get this. This really does serve as the basis for the presentation and, and what we're working f forward with. Uh, and I just wanted to be to share that with you because it's something very exciting that's come along with the BRM Renaissance. Now, again, the purpose of here today is to speak with all of you about the great BRM Renaissance. And as Estelle mentioned, my name is Tom Cruz. I am the member partner, knowledge provider partner, and uh, Director of Worldwide Advocacy for BRM Institute. This is a picture of Leonardo da Vinci, and why do I include him up here um, as we're talking about the word Renaissance? Well, da Vinci is no, what's known as essentially a Renaissance person. He is a polymath, or has is not only an artist, but he was an inventor in his day. He did had multiple areas of expertise and incredibly deep knowledge. He created things such as essentially the first car. Um, he designed this, and I, I believe it was called a self-automated cart. Um, he created a winged flying machine, is actually known to potentially have taken flight to the air years, hundreds of years before the Wright brothers even ended up doing it. You might recognize this image. This is possibly one of the most um, prolific images across the world. It's called the Vitruvian Man. And what Leonardo said is that he the way the human body and form fit perfectly within a square and a circle, it represented the divine connection between human form and the universe. So he's understanding the true value of human form during the Renaissance period. And of course, we all recognize this image here. So why am I sharing a little bit about da Vinci here? Well, as I mentioned, he is a polymath. But he's not the only artist of the Renaissance that period that took place during the 14th to 17th centuries. And I'm specifically speaking about the Renaissance right now to give you all a little bit of context as to what the BRM Renaissance compares to this as, as we're currently sitting in it. There are other incredible artists, philosophers, thinkers out there like Donatello that existed in the time of da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, Every single one of these people has made an, a positive impact on society that helped contribute to the modern age. Um, however, you couldn't necessarily call this Renaissance period a, a Renaissance period if it came on an individual basis. Leonardo alone couldn't have done it. Donatello couldn't have done it alone. Michelangelo, nor Raphael. They all had to come together and do it as a team, right? And while, while I mentioned this, this here in jest, looking at the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right, we all recognize that they gained their inspiration. And I, <clears throat> I know Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I believe it's Hero Turtles in the UK. Um, they, they gained their inspiration from the great Renaissance artists of the time. Those hundreds and hundreds of years ago, they were able to inspire and influence today's modern age. But it wasn't all rainbows and butterflies. In fact, immediately before the, the Renaissance, the bubonic plague took place, and that was estimated to have killed an, a, between 75 and 200 million people across Eurasia and North Africa. Um, you see this mask here, right? It's kind of, unfortunately, eerily similar in, in time of today. Um, but these are actually the masks that doctors during the bubonic plague wore to keep a distance and living in a time of fear and strife where, unfortunately, death was all around. The plague was taking people left and right. People didn't know where to turn. <clears throat> Pardon me. And people were being ruled, essentially, by fear at this time. But at the very end of the bubonic plague, when that finally was over, people began to come and emerge out of this difficult, difficult pandemic and focus on the things that were important. They focused on humanism, and that is a, a belief in the potential value and goodness of human beings. What that does is it focuses not just on rationality, but on everybody focusing on common human needs and bringing those together, combining those to create innovative ideas, inspire the Renaissance artists who eventually inspired modern society. Now, I want to mention once more, the Renaissance does compare to where the great BRM Renaissance is today. The source of, of the Renaissance, it came from <laughs> the bubonic plague, plague coming at the end of the medieval periods elements of fear and control being pumped into people. 
here today, we have experienced a similar, a similar pandemic, only that's been across the entire globe. Organizations have been focused on more hierarchical structures for a very long time uh, that I'm going to get into a little bit more and showing how we're moving away from this authority and control type mentality. The various attributes of the Renaissance are that they increased cultural interaction across the entire world during this period. So that was able to lead people towards technological or technological innovations and focusing more on the human needs within them. Business relationship management breaks down silos, as all of you know, inside your organization to increase employee interactions with everybody. BRM is rooted in the theory of relationshipism, which I'll share a little bit more in the future. You, you can get an idea, a basic idea is the root of that word, right, is relationship. And then, of course, there's strategic problem solving that comes to create innovation and in solve innovative problems. On an individual level, we recognize Renaissance polymaths like Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, and Donatello. Here at BRM Institute, BRMs, you are, <laughs> and, and consider that, at BRM Institute and the, the, the single global com BRM community, I apologize, every sin single one of you is a polymath. You focus on evolving culture. You not only evolve culture, but you build partnerships every single day with those around you. You drive value and you satisfy purpose. This is why you're here. That is the purpose of business relationship managers. The Renaissance period was essentially known as the bridge to modern society. So what exactly does that mean? What future are we headed into uh, as business relationship managers? And how can we influence the world moving forward? Well, to focus on that, I do want to take a step back and understand, well, why is BRM here today? Why is it truly important? And what is happening around us that is proving the value of relationships? First of all, starting off by the fact that organizational leaders are looking for purpose. I asked the question earlier today in, in that poll to get an understanding of whether or not you know your purpose. And luckily, most organizations do have a purpose, and a lot of you are able to identify and at least recognize that. And that's great. That falls in line with the fact that 93% of CEOs believe that organizations should contribute to social goals. Those social goals build up into an element of understanding that, well, they want to exist for a purpose and they want to do something good. This is why certified B corporations are becoming more popular that focus on balancing purpose and profit. Aaron mentioned earlier, um, earlier on the call, the triple bottom line, profit is evolving to become focused on people, purpose, and planet. Conscious capitalism even represents that those organizations focused on social good have a 10 times better performance, like Patagonia. And Patagonia's purpose is to build the best product, to cause no unnecessary harm, and to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. So Patagonia exists for a purpose, and they exemplify that as a, one of the original B corporations. Additional corporations that exist for purpose are things like Etsy. If you've heard of it, their purpose is to keep commerce human, and they connect thousands of artists worldwide to share and sell their wares and artistic pieces to individuals. Apple, their purpose statement is to, I think it's recently evolved, actually. Um, it, it was originally to bring the best computing experience to students, educators, and creative professionals but I believe their focus now is to have technology enable and empower your life. Everybody works towards this purpose in what they're doing every day, which is why I asked you to identify you, your organization's purpose as well. However, unfortunately, purpose alone can't exist. We can't just have good intentions. What we need to be able to do, and this is why I asked one of those other poly questions, is to connect purpose to strategy which ultimately trickles down into everything we do every day and drive operational excellence. Moving on just a little bit. Unfortunately, there are some things standing in the way of us working towards this purpose. As I mentioned earlier, that hierarchical structure on which many organizations are based, it has sort of a direct and controlled leadership style that focuses on keeping people in silos and not able to interact move out and really lowers the, the things that truly connect us and make us human. Con consider the Renaissance itself. 
boosting and, and building people up on focusing on humanism, connecting on our human needs. These hierarchical structures lower trust, lower safety, they lower innovation, and unfortunately, over decades and decades and decades of time, this has led to another type of epidemic. And that epidemic is not one of health, well, not necessarily immediate physical health, but it's a stress epidemic. In a recent study, it's found that work is a top three leading cause of stress in the United Kingdom, with 85% of people suffering from work-related stress. Of those who are stressed out, 54% of people are worried about their health. <laughs> it's funny I should say that as I as I need a drink of water and <coughs> Do you want me to bit. do you want me to fill a gap for a moment for one, Tom? Have a drink you have a drink of water at 6 30 in the morning, go for this. it. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> we're back. We're back. <laughs> oh you're doing you. great. <laughs> Appreciate it. So Really with that, though, I, I know that I have been worried for my health, especially during this pandemic. It's, it's difficult, it's emotional, it's physical. Every one of you, I'm sure, can probably relate to this in some way. Another study in 2021 said that 16, and believe it or not, this is November 5th of 2021. So just two weeks ago, uh, an article was published saying 69% of people are ready to quit their job within the next few months. In 2021, one in five people have experienced burnout. And this is perhaps the most startling statistic to me, is that 76% of people say that stress affects their relationships at home. Stressed out employees create stressed out families and stressed out children and stressed out children bring that into school and continue to perpetuate that cycle within our society. So what can we do? What can we do to change this and focus on instead of having stress be continuously existing throughout our lives, while it may always be there, what can we do to improve our well-being? Well, I'd like to encourage each of you to take that structure in your mind and flip it upside down. What is that reminiscent of? What shape does that sort of remind you of? I know what it reminds me of. It reminds me of a heart. And you may see a, a scientific formula in there for, <clears throat> and asking yourself, what does that mean? What is that inside of the heart? Well, that represents oxytocin, or what I like to deem as the relationship hormone. Oxytocin happens when great relationships exist between us. When we feel oxytocin in our body, it builds feelings of trust, safety, and innovation. Consider when you go to shake somebody's hand. When you shake their hand, you physically touch them, and if they, when, by in doing so, we recognize that, okay, this person is not going to hurt me. I can trust them a little bit. That boosts oxytocin in our body and creates a relationship that is easier to build. Stress is, is causing a lot of physical and mental and, and immune system issues. Stress actually creates another hormone, which is called cortisol, which actually inhibits our digestive systems. It inhibits our ability to heal in general. So those 54% of people who are concerned for their health, they weren't wrong to do so. But oxytocin actually stops the, product, the production of that cortisol hormone and in fact fortifies the immune system, making us healthier. So if we're able to focus on individual relationships around us, consider this. Consider building relationships that are great with everyone around you on your individual team. What kind of value could you all drive together? And I'd like to encourage you to take that one step further to, to consider if your entire organization is built on great relationships where oxytocin is firing in all directions, where people are feeling trustful, they're trustworthy, they're feeling safe to innovate and create. Well, what does that look like? That looks like the relationship-centered organization. So that hierarchical structure is evolving into something where trust and shared ownership are valued over everything. Leaders aren't a direct and control style down. In fact, everyone on this call is a leader in your own right. You have knowledge, skills, and expertise that's valuable to be shared with everyone around you. Relationship-centered organization is truly focused on the triple bottom line of people, purpose, and planet. I'm speaking these words out here, and you're, you're, I hope you're getting it to recognize and understand just what these words mean and how they affect you and your organization. 
Looking at this once more, I want to encourage you and, and make the assertion that there's infinite value potential in relationship-centered organizations. And this is, as I mentioned before, based on the theory of relationshipism, which explains the incredible, the incredible power potential that exists within organizational cultures and how relationships form the basis of that. So I, I, if there's one thing that all of you can recognize, understand, and take away from this, and it's what I'm going to mention here. If everybody understands this one premise, then you'll be able to uh, be able to communicate all of this over time and share the value of your BRM capability. And that premise is this. An organization's culture reflects all relationships that have anything to do with the organization. I'm going to say that one more time. An organization's culture reflects all relationships that have anything to do with the organization. So if our culture, every single organizational culture is unique because it's based on relationships. And that culture forms the largest source of energy that fuels value, that allows us to do what we do every day. And concern, considering if your organization has purpose and can combine that purpose with the effective relationships, then you're able to direct that potential energy in the right direction, all working together with shared ownership. So with all of that, an organ that the, the reason that BRM Institute has the logo where the R is encirculated or encapsulated by a square, that's showing that relationships need to form the cornerstone of your organization. When they form the cornerstone of the organization, the organization is focused not just on profit, but on the triple bottom line of encouraging the people around us by focusing on driving purpose, where profit is a natural offshoot of that. And ultimately, if our organizations can improve our own physical and, and emotional and mental well-being, we're able to improve the well-being of those around us, of the society. The organization contributes to societal goals, ultimately creating a better place for us to live. To explain how value actually comes from this, right? As a BRM, it can be difficult to explain what your value is and how this is driven. I'd like you to consider this graph here, where on the x-axis you have the number of people, and on the y-axis you have their individual ability to influence. Over time, as the number of people increase and each person's ability to influence through great relationships, through strong partnerships, through things like trust, as those increase, the relationship capital within your organization increases as well, creating more space for innovation, more value driven that affects and drives the triple bottom line. I want to sort of bring everything together that we've we've discussed here today and focus on the BRM renaissance, right? We, we came to understand that a renaissance is essentially a rebirth. It's a rebirth of artistic values, of innovation, of creativity that boost human needs and support humans and the relationships between them. Well, we're evolving from that sort of top-down hierarchy to become more of a relationship-centered organization. And we understand that at the cornerstone of that is the business relationship management capability. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the capability, the discipline, and role. The capability itself is everything that it takes to nurture relationships in your organization. An advanced BRM capability strengthens collaboration and drives a culture of creativity, innovation, and shared ownership. So by advancing your organization's BRM capability, you allow every single relationship to reach its full potential. Now, your organization's BRM capability is supported by the global BRM discipline. As we were discussing earlier, as, as Malini, you mentioned on the BRM Fundamentals class, there are BRMs from across the entire globe. Everyone is contributing to the BRM discipline to help move forward together in this renaissance. Your organization's BRM capability is supported by the discipline, and you as an individual practice the BRM role. Through the BRM role, you evolve culture, you build partnerships, you drive value, you satisfy organizational purpose, and you can do this in any number of ways. 
by partnering with leaders, both inside and outside the organization, like we're doing here today. We're partnering with each other and we're not working within the same organization, but we are driving value here together. You can optimize the organizational factors that your organization is known for, such as its brand, the infinite potential, technology factor, and I'll get more into those in a little bit. And you can proactively sense and anticipate changes that are happening all around us every day. The more we're able to communicate, the better relationships that we're able to build, the more effective we can be at our roles. So with all of this, I, I do want to share with you, you know, just sort of the direction that we're heading. What is driving this BRM renaissance? You all recognize that the BRM Institute brand logo, you might have noticed that it's changed. And we, it's changed for a good reason. To in, have the R be circulated or by encapsulated uh, by a square, focusing on relationships. So while we at BRM Institute are evolving, the entire global discipline is evolving as well. Certifications are evolving. The BRMP itself just last month was had its inaugural course. So the foundational certification for business relationship management has been evolved and it is moving forward with all of this information. So everything I've shared here today, everything I'm going to continue sharing with you, this exists within the BRMP course, only I've only touched at a very, very high level. This actually goes deeply in depth as to why BRM, what it is and specific tools you can do to use to improve your role. The CBRM itself takes that to the next level. That's currently in, in its evolution stages where the, uh, it's the practitioner certification. So focusing on how to do your role effectively, it takes all the tools that were introduced in the BRMP, adds heavily onto those, and really allows you to go in depth, analyze, and capture that value to be able to articulate it to your organization about the BRM capability. We're coming up with different specialty credentials that focus on your individual function, such as the technology micro -creden or technology credential, the people credential, or the or human resources essentially. Apart from the certifications themselves, we we recognize that the BRM capabilities importance is growing. The BRM role is becoming it is becoming function generic. Many of us here today, I would venture to guess, are within the technology realm. However, relationships are not just technology based. The entire organization can benefit from a BRM capability. So you as the, uh, it can perform the BRM role regardless of the function that you're in. The BRM role is, <laughs> is a truly a special role to have. If you sit back and think about it, say I'm focused on building those up around me. That's a really, really special thing to have. And moving forward with that, it's possibly the best role, in, in my opinion, is, is the best role that you can have. It's being a BRM is the best job that you can have. So the BRM discipline is evolving to help you become a master at, at the best job that you will ever have. With that, the BRM body of knowledge is continually evolving. And I'm going to share a little bit of, about that right now. You all may recognize this image here, the relationship maturity model. It has recently evolved. Um, you, if you kind of zone into this a little bit more, you'll recognize that it's changed a little bit. <clears throat> Focusing on that sort of level one relationship that you enter into with people, right? That's more being reactive. You see that word there. It's focusing on what they want to say. It's because you don't necessarily have a trusted partnership or trusted relationship at this point. Working yourself all the way up to level five means being purposeful, means converging with shared ownership of strategy and results to ultimately contribute and satisfy purpose. You'll notice the BR mission there at the bottom of the screen, evolve culture, build partnerships, drive value, satisfy purpose. Each of these words is more than just words. The BRMP and the body of knowledge themselves take a deep dive into what exactly each of these elements means and teaches you how to go about doing that. You may recognize and, and have had conversations about being strategic, right? Strategic versus tactical BRMs, but it, this is evolving. It's, it's no longer against one another and it's the tactical has evolved into what's known as the execution domain. So while it's important to focus on becoming a strategic BRM, on building and shaping strategy with the leaders around us, 
we also have to make sure that things are getting done every day. And we can't just be planners. We need to be doers. So it really does come into having a balance of that yin, the yang of strategy, planning, thinking, some of the great Renaissance thinkers. But think about it. Da Vinci would not have created the flying machine if he just sat there thinking about it all day. Another element, and this is one thing that I do want to focus on, is the BRM capability framework. This provides a structural framework for you to communicate to your leaders and to your organization of how we can evolve from now to new. The current state becomes the new state. We're moving forward together in this renaissance. But consider, as we move into the new state, what becomes the current state? Well, that new state actually goes back to being now because it's an ever-evolving process. As you're focusing on evolving culture, building partnerships, driving value to ultimately satisfy purpose. Some of the inputs into this are the fact that you need to recognize your organization's purpose and strategy. You need to understand it, work with leaders to identify and bring that into it. And then of course, has the limitless growth and improvement. We're focused not only on ourselves, on building ourselves up, but the relationships around us as well to ultimately drive value and create and optimize value within our organizations. I'm just going to share a couple more quick things before I wrap up for, for the day. The five organizational factors. I've mentioned these before. This is what your organization is known for. Every organization is unique because they're built on a culture of relationships that bring unique ideas into it. The human factor is focused on building up the humans within it. The brand factor is what your organization is known for. Where is the innovation hub within your organization? Is it, is it just one specific area or is everybody creating innovation all the time? Technology will forever be a part of organizations, so it's important to recognize and understand how that falls within your organization. And ultimately, your organization exists for a purpose, and that purpose is to exist for a long time, to create and drive infinite value. And this starts with you. This starts with an individual BRM mindset. I, I really do like this image here of looking of the cat looking into the mirror and saying, I'm a lion. Well, yeah, if you believe it, you can become it. So by focusing on the BRM mindset of being relationship centered, of being playful, right? It's incredibly important to have that oxytocin boost within our system to allow room for creativity. We want to have fun at work every day. Becoming self-actualized. That's what Renaissance is about. It's about becoming the best self that you can be to enable and empower th those around you. It's about being fearless, and fearless does not mean the absence of fear. You can be afraid, it's okay, but having the confidence to step into something and say, I believe in myself, I believe in what we're doing, that truly exhibits fearlessness. And of course, being purposeful, as we all know. You're all supported here by the folks at BRM Institute. You might recognize some of these faces here. Um, and we truly attempt to embody the relationship center organization. Um, as Aaron here says, uh, it, we reserve the right to be smarter every day. So we aren't, we aren't perfect at this point, but we're trying. We're constantly working within this evolution. And I truly have noticed things that have, <laughs> have made me feel very proud to be a part of this organization and that I've, I've seen the great evolution of myself just having been there for four years. Here at the Institute, we provide the hub for training and certifications for you to ensure that you're getting the best knowledge and able to communicate that to your organizations. We provide access to the single global BRM community by bringing membership with um, thousands uh, strong. And we also help create and evolve these templates, tools, research, providing all of this information out there while working with BRMs across the globe. You see the BRM I box there, that little I stands for interactive. So through BRM Institute, we are working constantly with BRMs from across the globe in different working groups, volunteer capacities to evolve the body of knowledge and keep it interactive and always evolving. Earlier today, I shared the purpose for BRM Institute, which is to improve ourselves, our organizations, and our world by connecting relationships to results. And again, I invite all of you to recognize that this is a shared purpose. If the single global BRM community is able to access that infinite value potential and build those relationships up and connect that to all the organizations around us, then we're truly going to be able to change the world in a renaissance fashion. fashion. fashion.
I want to just mention a few of you here on the call today. Um, this is everybody who's it, it's taken, and I, I might have even missed some of you, and if so, I apologize. But everybody who's come together today to provide this great experience to everyone. Um, Jeremy, in particular, thank you so much for helping me uh, with the poly and, and us working through all of this. Estelle, thank you for leading and being a great voice of this and just constantly letting me know, um, <laughs> letting me know what's going on, helping me and supporting me in this element because, again, it is a relationship network. This is a single global BRM community that we're all focusing on together. You as individuals, you even as a community in the UK are not alone. There's a global community here ready to support you going through the same challenges every step of the way. Now, I'm going to leave you with one last thing that is focus on what you can do from this point on. Around the globe, organizations are realizing that they already have a BRM capability and that they need to advance it. They're increasingly becoming more relationship-centered and rewarding those who are at the forefront of this renaissance. Take Glenn Ramirez, for example. He is a BRMP, and he recently became CIO of Mark Anthony Group, which is a, one of the largest alcohol distributors within North America. He began volunteering back in 2013, and by volunteering and adding to the single global BRM community, he was able to learn and be at the forefront of this renaissance to upskill himself and be constantly immersed in other BRMs in the way that we are all here today. Ultimately, he ended up becoming CIO of the Mark Anthony Group, and he was able to present and become the keynote speaker at the 2020 BRM Connect. If you're not quite yet ready to volunteer, there are many other things you can do to support your role and advance your organization's capability. You can join the Explorers. If you see that link at the very bottom, um, this is a free, the free membership to BRM Institute where you can stay informed and get updates on the latest things that are going on and, and just have a pulse, your finger on the pulse of what's, what's happening around you. Consider the BRM Fundamentals course as well, and it's, I'm, I'm really happy that uh, Malini was able to, to speak with us prior to this presentation and, and saying that the inaugural newly evolved BRM Fundamentals course uh, was truly spectacular. It filled her with in inspiration, and that's what I hope it can do for all of you. The BRM Fundamentals course is just a one-day course, um, and it really takes a deep dive into what I've shared here today, but it doesn't go quite as in-depth as the certifications themselves, which is the next step that you can do as well. Become certified in the BRMP and ultimately work yourself, your, work your way towards CBRM and becoming a master in business relationship management. At the end of the day, just have fun. <laughs> I, I really enjoy putting together these types of presentations. It fills me with, with joy. Uh, I'm able to en enjoy myself, interact with all of you, and have fun while I'm doing it. Remember that the single global BRM community is here for everyone. Become members of, and, and become masters of the best job you've ever had by having better relationships and a better world. I want to thank everybody here for having been here on the call with me today. And if Aaron's still here as well, and, and perhaps Marlene has joined, um, we're going to be here for the next half hour or so to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. That was absolutely brilliant. Well done. I, I present everybody uh, the, the BRM Institute. So over to you for a chat and over to you, Marlene, now. Well, Tom, you did a fantastic job with that presentation. Thank you so much. It's really, uh, you have such a great way of articulating our vision and all the things that we have, uh, not only in our in our uh, arsenal of knowledge, but uh, in our hearts. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, did a great, fantastic job. Um, I want to thank Malini. Uh, I, I'm shocked to see you here as well because she, she and I were I, we were just on the phone a couple hours ago together uh, with uh, with uh, the fundamentals class. So I'm I'm excited to hear uh, hear how that's going. Uh, so what kind of questions do we got? So I'm going to uh, promote Gavin up and uh, put him on screen so we can ask his question in person rather than hide behind the uh, comment box. So that's right, Kevin. Quit hiding. <laughs> All right. Um, so you start. You start. I thought you were going to answer your, my question while I was typing it, Marlene. But what are the differences and the similarities that you see with the kind of work we're doing around around the world? 
that relationships have been heightened and I'm going to say the the positive out of COVID is that relationships are incredibly important and organizations understand that now. Um, if we can't have relationships at a physical level because we can't be <laughs> in person anymore, it expanded into under, you know, this kind of relationship, like the, the, the virtual relationship and they are understanding it at a, um, a level they never did before. And there's no way I can tell you, no matter how much great, how great your technology is, there's no way that getting zoom and teams and a virtual environment turned overnight couldn't happen with people and it couldn't happen with people working incredibly well together to make that shift happen. And that, that right there is, it speaks volumes. And um, I've, you know, when you look at what uh, type of content is out there right now, you look at Simon Sinek, you look at all of these really great influential speakers, they're talking about relationships. They're talking about working with others and how to build those those partnerships. They may not use the same language. I, I think it's in my blood now to use some of these, <laughs> these words. Uh, but uh, I've, I got a report out, uh, Alan, who um, Tom put his picture as one of the, the influencers at Verum Institute. Uh, Alan Kudakun attended a, uh, a event planning industry. It was It's like the event industry planning event. Uh, there was like 4,500 uh, event planners in Vegas. And he said that every keynote talked about relationships, talked about building relationships. So we at Verum Institute are leading the charge. We are you know, we're the ones in front of this and BRMs are in front of it. So if BRMs can bring this in, into the organization at the level that some of these keynote presentations are or some of these real high influencing uh, speakers are, uh, just imagine what your organization can do as they're kind of now, we're leading the charge and, and, it, and we've got all these, you know, cheerleaders behind us that that is making it easier. Just imagine how much support you as BRMs are going to have now that the whole world's behind you. Yeah, Gavin, I'll, I'll maybe spin it a little different. The role, the challenges, they're the same, no matter your industry, no matter where you are. What I kind of see or kind of what we see across across the Institute around the, around the world is an, awa an awakening, a maturity level of the BRM, right? Like uh, some are still victims. Others are realizing, hey, I don't have to ask permission anymore. I've been empowered. I, I have this role. Let's go. And so, you know, that's think about it from that perspective. So if you're spending your day <clears throat> waiting for somebody to tell you what to do, waiting for permission to do something, that's probably an indicator's time to evolve a little bit, take ownership and go. And those are the, the teams that are really out there making a difference and they're moving their organizations forward. So they're not sitting around waiting. Does that, does that help? Does that add a little clarity to it? Yeah, I think I was kind of, wondering whether you'd seen like a difference in the, the approach that's being taken perhaps over on your side than in Europe or just how how the role's viewed? Well, it comes from from backgrounds, right? So UK, very ITIL heavy. So we had our breakout room here earlier when, when I came in and there was some conversations around, we, we, we kind of grew up talking about business as our customer, right? And position ourselves as a service provider. And it's like, we got to stop doing that. We've got to show up as partners, stop calling our business customers because they're not, right? So we see a lot more of that in the UK in particular because of the, the originations of ITIL, so, you know, giving you that as an example. Whereas kind of the further away you get, that stopped happening maybe 10 years ago. So, but but it's happening. Look at everybody on this call, right? So there, there is this awakening already. So it's exciting. It's exciting to see it. Yeah, where, and I can tell you the, uh, oh, sorry, Aaron, I thought you were done. Go ahead. Which is one comment where, where I think the biggest challenge is, is not the BRMs, it's the CIOs, right? It's the, the organizational leaders. Do they understand they have a BRM capability? Do they understand why it matters? And, and, and so that's where the, sort of the ignite comes from to do something and get out there and really make changes. Go ahead, Marlon. Yeah, so uh, the director, I think that was his title at the BRM Fundamentals class. Uh, I, I heard why he was in, um, having his entire staff attend this uh, BRM Fundamentals workshop. And I was just like, 
you're my hero I actually put it in in the chat I was like you're my hero uh it because he actually just said everything that we've been saying for years and he's out of the he's out, out of the UK and he's coming over to the United States uh in short time and but every single person on his team heard him say that heard him say how important relationships were and he in fact used uh almost the almost the same uh uh example that Aaron Barnes has said for years. I'm not going to, I think Aaron's, if you've been around Aaron at all in some of these events, you'll know he used to say, well, you know, the guy that does my yard, you know, he's, he's a service provider. He provides a service. He does my landscaping. He does my yard. Um, the, the guy, uh, the director of the, cl that was in the class uh, this morning, uh, he said the, um, I believe it was the garbage man, the, the janitor at the office. He's like, he provides me a service. However, are we making his life better? You know, are we are we as employees in our organization making just our janitor's life better and easier and making that relationship stronger? And I was just like, oh my God, you're my hero. This is so great. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a global organization who is adopting everything at its core it, it was awesome i was i was blown away so uh, so you see the changes and and it's, you know we we would hope that it comes from the top down but as aaron says it's it's at the cio level that's almost stopping it so uh, the grassroots effort of brms making a change is definitely uh taking uh effect and they are the CIOs and the CEOs are starting to understand the importance of it because of everyone on this call, because of great leaders like yourselves that truly are inspiring and willing to make the change and push hard and not let it uh, be forgotten. So it's it's really a big part of it is, is all of you on the phone. What's really um, exciting as well, I think, is um, seeing things like COP26 the last couple of weeks. Those leaders all came to that conference in person because they knew it was going to make a difference to be there. They collaborated. They they got some good results. Not not every result was great. And I looked at what everything that was happening and thinking where the relationships were built and formed, they got a good result. Where the relationships didn't form, they ended up not quite getting the result and therefore the planet is not going to be quite as good a place as it could have been if they just had those relationships a bit better and um, my company was very much sort of front and center of that um, conference as an electricity company and and they felt it they all talked about how um, you know some of the real strong political leaders were talking to the leaders of industry because they need them and building those relationships for the future was something that they all commented on um, but my question was going to be to Aaron. Um, when we were in that breakout room earlier and we were talking about what makes an Uber BRM, and I said, uh, fundamentally, it's all the soft skills. And you pulled me up on that quite rightly. And I'd like you to share that with everyone. <laughs> <clears throat> so language, right? Language. There's nothing more important than the words you're using. It, it creates barriers or it knocks them down. And so when we use the term soft skills that soft squishy weak right that's not what these skills are these are power skills there's nothing more important and so i encourage our, our group never use the word soft skills again ever there's nothing more important than these skills that you're learning as brms and the relationships and so they're your power skills if I can add to that as well briefly a little bit, Aaron, I, I'm a little bit kind of touchy-feely type things as well. I've also heard them called core skills, and I truly believe that too, right? You you own it at your core, and you you feel that and communicate that outwards. Love it. <clears throat> so and another word, we're talking about words, it's fun. Everybody write this one down. <clears throat> Inner, sorry, I'm like losing my voice here. Inner stand. So Tom just said you feel it inside, right? Don't don't understand something as you go forward. Understand it. So it's like a new word. We're creating new words, having fun. But oh, seriously, goodness. that's <laughs> when it matters, right? That's when it's like, wow, I'm part of this, and we're we're excited. Do you understand it? <clears throat> that's a new one. Okay, we'll have to put that in the Aaron Barnes dictionary. <laughs> the language is the language of Aaron Barnes. <laughs> it, 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 it's an evolving language <laughs> on a daily, as you can see. <laughs> Jack made it a hashtag. Love it. 
Oh, that, that. It was um, it was interesting when you talk about language and words with, that we use and uh, things that we're creating. I'm you know I, I make jokes uh, you know that it's there on the Aaron Barnes list, but uh, in the class this morning, um, or excuse me, in our knowledge provider quarterly meeting that we had just uh, last night as well. I don't know these two days seem like it's just one really long day. I'm not sure how everything got scheduled at the same time, but it did. Um, no, <laughs> not on purpose. This was to, it, somehow this scheduling didn't was not coordinated uh, months and months and months ago. Uh, but in our knowledge provider quarterly meeting last night, um, a gentleman in Australia was uh, asking specifically about the theory of relationshipism. He he was saying it was a he actually was having a hard time saying it like it didn't roll off his tongue and he's like where'd this come from you know I looked it up and it, all like all I see is BRM Institute and I'm like well that's because we created it you know we we this is something that that we developed and launched in 2019 and and Tom did a great job explaining how that how theory of relationshipism uh, works well with uh, you know the philosophy and the discipline and. Uh, we are we're we are leading the charge we are creating things we are the innovators we're the you know wanting to step outside the box of the new norm and it's interesting because we have the you know we have the the box you know with the r and our um <laughs> uh you know with with the r it's like yeah we have a box there but we're stepping outside of that you know it's everything that we're doing is pushing pushing outside of that box from what everybody's used to it is very much uh i would say cultural especially in some cultures relationships is not something that's been in the forefront right um if you you look at that and and if you look at someone directly in the eye that's actually disrespectful so how relationships are developed is culturally different but we can stick words and the words you know don't necessarily impact cultures in the same way that that uh, some other things can and bringing it to the attention at that higher level can make a difference and make change in those organizations even with those uh those cultural uh restrictions so the importance of relationships is what matters not how the necessarily you you execute the relationship but it's the importance of having one and establishing one and fostering that and enabling that and growing and developing and advancing it so that's that's what's really cool to see because it's happening and you know being here over six years now um it's really cool it's it, again i think i think covid you know that's the positive out of COVID is, is it amplified the importance of relationships and honestly the BRM role, because I can tell you if, if the majority of you are technology focused and you guys probably were the ones saying, this is how we can get Zoom out. This is how we can get Microsoft Teams going. This is how we can make every single person in our organization virtually uh, effective. Uh, and and that it was like a, a, a spotlight was was put on your face and you wa watched as you walked around virtually in your organization. So I hope that you guys actually realized how important you were during that transition and that shift because they wouldn't have been able to probably do what they did without you. And if that wasn't on your 2020, you know, accomplishments list for your 2021 raise you should have got, uh, make sure that it's on there because you're still doing it. You're still making sure that they're uh, meeting their purpose every single day and um no one else is probably as focused on it as you are marlene I, that's very useful thank you um and as you mentioned a lot of us are it background is it time that we actually start losing it from that job title and actually start positioning the business relationship manager in the business because what i can see going forward in my role it's not just the IT, it's actually inspiring, organizing and building those relationships between the different departments within an organization. It's not just facing IT. Organizations lack people to go in and actually build those relationships, organizing it and challenge people and um, yeah, support people, yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, so do, did you just have like a, a cloud of, of purple smoke go because that is exactly what we've been trying to get everyone to understand in IT. It's this isn't about IT. 
This isn't about uh, the, the, the hardware and the software that you're doing. This is about everything in your organization. And here at BRM Institute, we're uh, heavily emphasizing removing the word IT and shifting to technology. Uh, because when you focus on IT, it it minimizes some of the other other things that are going on in your technology world. Uh, but yes, you absolutely should be advancing the capability. As a BRM, that's converging, right? Convergence is all about B a BRM, and that's outside of the technology world. Um, that's outside your IT scope, right? So you have to do it in a tech, you know, because of the technology and what you have to do with your uh, with your organization. But you're touching every single one of those functions through relationships, through your through your connections, through your network. Are, the, you're, you're a high influencer and you may not even know it. Uh, you're influencing change and you're influencing uh, the BRM capability and the mission without them even probably realizing it. So, yes, you, you so have that. Let me jump that, in. Marlene, so just kind of adding to that, there's questions in chat. So, so the global replacement for IT, it's already happening, is technology. So somebody said digital. I'll tell you all, digital's not enough. D digital is just a moment in time, right, as digital came to be. At the end of the day, it's technology, it's people instead of HR. They're not human resources. And so each area is going through that little bit of evolution. Jeremy, to your point, what happens and it depends really on that executive leadership inside of organizations brm capability rolls up to the very top right it's the organization is made up of relationships and so if you have a savvy ceo or whatever the title is at that top top layer they're awake they're paying attention and they're like that's what i want relationship centered organization get that team over here they end up reporting in at that level if we're talking about reporting structures and you are driving horizontally and vertically across the entire organization. Yeah. And so we see that. We see that from, from every area. The, also, there's another point I was going to raise. Is sometimes I think organizations have too many BRMs because I think you have too many BRMs. Obviously, it depends on the size of the organization, but I've worked in some organizations where actually there is only true one BRM who's able to work at that strategic relationship level at that level but you have four or five people all trying to be strategic across the company. And I don't think that works because it just gets diluted because you can't, you can't have six people, you can't have six BRMs turning up to every strategy meeting across the company. Yeah, yeah, too many, too many, right? Yeah, and, and it, it comes down to shared ownership. So you're yeah. creating that culture of shared ownership, shared ownership of strategy, and then identifying who needs to be in those meetings because you do need those people regardless of title. So title take, starts to take a back seat. Everybody in the organization needs the BRM skills. And then no matter what their titles are, right? We're, we're driving strategy. Do you have the idea docs, the value plans, ideation, value management, all those things. And then what, what you all will do as BRMs, how do you, how do you take those things and, and drive and ensure there's a strategy? You know, do we have impact reports? Are we talking about what, what the impact is from these relationships? So you might have a BRM team that's then elevating some of those pieces, right? So when we see that, we see that. So there's VP of relationships, right? So it's it's evolving for sure. Yeah. I will uh, hand over to Jack now. Thank you very much. And I could say, Jeremy, that um, you uh, probably got a, a load of uh, notes here in the chat saying, too many BRMs? What? No, you can never have too many BRMs, right? <laughs> <laughs> Tanya has been in yeah. chat playing off of that. So, but, but won't the IT BPs, business partners, have specialist skills? So it's, it starts with, do you have the ability to go have a conversation? Right? Do you have the ability to walk in that door and be fearless? That's what it starts with. You don't have to be an IT expert. You don't have to be a people expert to be a technology BRM, to be a people BRM. You need to have the ability to talk, drive conversations, think strategically and tactically, and then bring the right people in based on what the situation is. So situational awareness. Does it help? Absolutely, right? But, but it's not a requirement. You don't have to be a, a technologist and know everything about technology to be a technology BRM. Some of the best ones we've worked with have never been in IT a day in their life. Jag, go ahead. 
Yeah, Jack had a question. Hi, so <laughs> mine might be a bit left field. Um, <clears throat> I liked your point about oxytocin, Tom. I don't know if people <laughs> saw what I said, shared about that, but um, I didn't need gas and air. I went into complete hypnobirthing. I relied on oxygen, oxygenating my body and gave birth without any pain relief. <laughs> so if you're ever, um, you know, getting nervous before a presentation, I guarantee you take those deep breaths and, and it's just a chemical reaction. Oxygenate your body. You perform better. Uh, you present better. And um, don't feel afraid to, you know, switch your camera off and just do it. And I, I, I did a few breaths before my culture, you know, change piece just to kind of get me centered again. Um, so it was a really good point. I'm really glad you weaved that in, Tom. So I suppose mine is a little bit around people, purpose and planet and inclusion. So why is it when I write Happy Diwali, Diwali keeps getting spell checked and my, you know, and people writing Eid Mubarak and it's just not recognised. That's a big, strong message to send out to people that it is not recognised, you know. So, you know, and so a point was around, um, you know, are we in a position as BRMs to, again, going back to culture and ethical design. So if we are in the early stages of design talks or with project managers, you know, should we be bold? Should we be in that meeting and, and really talking about the the ethical, you know, um, impact on on products? So turning something that's um, not tangible right now, but more tangible into into reality. And I just wondered where, you, you, you know, you thought about that and and if that's, you know, when you're saying be bold as a BRM, be fierce, is that is that kind of the mark you want us to take? I'm going to let Aaron answer that one. Of course, every day you got you to be bold. But it, it comes down to the, back to that situational awareness, right? Who's in the room? What are their priorities? And, if, and then think about the triple bottom line. If we're talking about something that's going to impact the planet and, and chew up all of our resources, you do, right? But sometimes those conversations are hard sometimes they're not going to listen but you see you, you just what i've what, kind of what we've learned through this some people aren't there and they don't want to hear that stuff right if that's the top leader of the organization if you try if if your convictions are there i do that every day right so you, you want to push those buttons but be 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 i guess realize they may take the outside of the organization as a result of that, right? So you need to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's I think there's quite a bit of emotional intelligence that needs to be uh, part of the BRM role. Um, the competencies uh, that we have evolved uh, include a lot of that around uh, the build partnerships and um, evolving culture uh, competencies. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at the the evolved body of knowledge, it's out on the online campus. Uh, take a look at the, the the evolved role competencies. It's shifted quite a bit from what it was uh, to be geared more around our mission and a lot of those things that you just talked about. Um, you have to be able to uh, have some thick skin to be a BRM. You guys yeah. are are the are the probably the strongest uh, leaders in the organization, and no one knows it. Why not stand up and roar, be that lion, and uh, make sure that that if you you get rejected, so what? You're gonna go back into that meeting the next day and just still be as fierce and and roar as loud as you can for the right reasons. You guys are doing the right things for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And you should never, never feel bad about that. You should never yeah. feel rejected for that. The person that's rejecting you needs a mindset, mindset shift. That's what yeah. they need. And you're the ones who are able to do it. Uh, and you can do it in a way that is non-evasive. Why? Because you guys are BRMs. You know how to do this. I mean, this is what you do and what a great job to have. And, you know, Tom was talking about, you know, he thinks it's the best job there is in an organization. Heck, yeah, there, you get to you get to talk to everybody. You get to learn every single person in the organization. You get to know who all the high influencers. It's like you get social hour every single day. You get paid to be social. Enjoy that. Use it to your advantage. But understand that with <clears throat> that comes great power and yeah. great responsibility and using it wisely. 
you can you can make such an impact with a CEO that someone can't, but what you make change with that CEO will impact the person who can't get to the CE, the CEO or the CIO. So your voice is incredibly important and don't mm-hmm. let rejection or don't let uh, a mindset that isn't hasn't shifted, you know, mm-hmm. change that. You know what you need to do. You know what your charge is. Yeah, I think it's um, having that rounded human view to it all because I had one example where uh, there was a lot of pressure to sign a contract on a well-being app at a different organization and reading through some of the storyboards and things like that you know I, I just said is the word tribe going to be offensive to anyone this is a global well-being app um, have we checked that you know this is an Australian company wanting us to deploy something globally for the first time have we checked in on that and I stopped the contract from being signed because it was you know people in native asia native canada found it quite offensive and this is a, yeah. a well-being app completely contradicting what we want to set out to do so stop the ink on the contract and get them to rewrite a version for us but that's that's the value add you know just to like you said be bold and get get these things checked if it's a little niggle i guarantee you you know you need to be vocal about it uh you know what <clears throat> I applaud you. That is amazing. Good for you. Uh, you're bringing awareness in uh, even at a contract level that would have never been addressed before, right? Those things should have been talked about before the contract was even written, uh, but you stopped it. That's a bold move. That made a statement. That got some attention. Good for you, Jack. Gosh, not just your hair is getting attention, but everything you're doing is. I love what you're. I I, I can't wait to come on these events and see what your what your hair. Can't wait to like. get a hug from you, Marlene. You said I'm a hug, <laughs> Lisa. I can't wait to get a hug. <laughs> That's your hug. Um, once again, you guys have done it again. We've we've gone right up to the bridge. So the uh, we we are due a break time at this very moment in time. I'm just so impressed. It's like everyone's literally keeping to the clock. It's.